Right, so good afternoon everyone. I am Lauren Dempster. I'm a research fellow at Queen's University Belfast based in the School of Law. Uh, so as Cheryl mentioned, I was involved in the project that um, she led, um, or is still leading, I should say, on victimhood in the past in Northern Ireland. Uh, today I'm going to present um, some previous research I did, which was actually my PhD research, which examined um, the issue of the, the disappearances that happened during the conflict or troubles in Northern Ireland. And specifically, I looked at um, how the response to those disappearances can be considered in regards of broader debates on dealing with the past. So this research was carried out at Queen's between 2012 and 2016. Um, so in terms of, of my methods, I um, interviewed, uh, um, I tried to speak to as many different people as possible connected to this issue. So I spoke with um, victims' families, I spoke with politicians, I spoke with journalists, I spoke with representatives of the Republican movement and others who are engaged in legacy issues. Um, I'm going to focus today on one specific um, aspect of my, my research, and this was the lessons that we can take from the Independent Commission for the Location of Victims' Remains with regards to dealing with the past. Um, specifically, I'm going to focus on the inclusion in the Stormont House Agreement of the line that the ICLVR, so the Commission for the Location of Victims' Remains, will be used as a precedent for the development of the Independent Commission on Information Retrieval. Um, so to give a quick overview then of, of what, what my presentation is going to look like, um, I'm going to begin with the Stormont House Agreement and, and that line on the um, use of the ICLVR as a precedent for the ICIR. I'm then going to look a little bit at the mechanics of the ICLVR and how that will compare with what the Stormont House Agreement has said the ICIR will look like. Um, then I'm going to look at some broader lessons that we can take from the ICLVR with regards dealing with the past. So I'm going to look at trust, the role of leadership, also the importance of context and the spirit in which legacy issues are approached. Um, finally, I'm going to enter one caveat on the use of the ICLVR as an, an example or a precedent for the establishment of the ICIR before drawing some brief conclusions. So to look at the Stormont House Agreement, in Cheryl's paper she introduced the, the Stormont House Agreement and that the agreement sets out that four institutions are going to be established to attempt to address the legacy of the past. So those four institutions, as Cheryl said, will be a historical investigations unit, an oral history archive, an implementation and reconciliation group and the Independent Commission on Information Retrieval, which is the, the institution that I'm going to focus on today. So in Clause 41 of the Stormont House Agreement, um, it says that the ICIR, which will be essentially the sort of the truth recovery element of the Stormont House institutions. So it will allow victims and survivors to come forward and confidentially seek information about the deaths of their loved ones during the conflict. Um, in the Stormont House Agreement, it says that the ICIR will be built on the will be sorry built on the precedent provided by the Independent Commission on the Location of Victims' Remains. Um, so. To look at the ICLVR and the proposed ICIR, the two institutions share similar purposes. They are aimed at gathering information in relation to conflict-related events in a confidential way. So in that regard, it makes sense that the mechanisms um, that establish each of these institutions would be comparable. So like the ICLVR, the ICIR is to be established by legislation um, in both the British and Irish jurisdictions. It will be independent of the justice system and like the ICLVR, the ICIR will be unable to disclose information provided to it to either law enforcement or intelligence agencies. So this issue of, of the confidential um, collection of, collecting of information is really what connects the ICLVR to the ICIR. With regards to that information, the information that's provided to the Independent Commission on Information Retrieval will be inadmissible in court proceedings. The identities of those who provide the information will not be disclosed. Um, and as is the case with the ICLVR, providing information to the ICIR does not render an individual immune from prosecution. So what the ICLVR and the ICIR will both have in common is that they're not amnesties. The legislation provides a limited immunity from prosecution that applies solely to the passage of information to the ICIR. So if, if an individual provides information to the ICIR and information, sorry, evidence comes um, Come to, come to light via other means, they can still be prosecuted. So as, it, as the ICIR doesn't rule out prosecution either of particular crimes or of particular individuals, it is not an amnesty. It's a, it's a limited immunity around, based around confidentiality of the information passed. Um, one thing I, I, I've, I've 
argue in, in my research on the disappeared is that if we purely look to the mechanics of the process of the independent commission for the location of victims remains we blinker ourselves to other benefits from that process so to um, the commission for the location of victims remains was established in 1999 and to date the remains of 13 of the 16 disappeared as Michael touched on in his introduction have been located so the ICLVR has, has been relatively successful um, in a context where we are waiting on a, the establishment of mechanisms to look at the past in a more comprehensive way. The ICLVR offers a valuable example of one way of dealing with a specific um, aspect of, of the legacy of the conflict. So to look at those broader lessons that we can take, the first one that I've highlighted here is trust. The importance of trust in relation to the process for recovering the remains of the disappeared um, manifests itself in three key ways. So the first is the management of expectations. So in 1999, when the IRA released a statement acknowledging their involvement in disappearances, that statement included um, the line that they said that we believe we have established the whereabouts of a number of burial locations. Indeed, early newspaper headlines at the time as well um, indicated that recovery of the remains would be rapid. So this is just one example here from the Irish News. Um, the headline is, families can finally grieve as IRA hands over bodies. So this sense that the process would happen quickly. Other newspaper stories suggested that the bodies of the disappeared would be recovered within weeks or in some cases even days. Um, I interviewed a detective inspector with the guards who was involved in those early searches and he talked about how those expectations were genuine. He thought the process would, would move quickly. He said everybody thought it would be a very quick process um, but after 24 hours we realised that wasn't going to be the case. However, the development of trust is linked to the expectation of outcome, particularly the expectation of a positive outcome. So when these expectations were created that could not realistically be met, um, this provided conditions for distrust to develop. And in, in the sort of early years um, of the search process, there was calls from, from victims, families in the media um, that suggested that they were, they were losing faith a little bit in the process. Uh, so I think in terms of, of this issue of managing expectations, what it says or what it should tell us with regards to the establishment of the Independent Commission on Information Retrieval is that it's important that the, for those victims and survivors who are engaging with the ICIR that their expectations are managed and that um, we are realistic about what is achievable. So the second element of trust is that what the experience of the ICLVR shows is that it takes time for trust to develop. So the location of victims' remains legislation was passed in 1999, but if you look at this timeline here, it really wasn't until nearly 10 years after that that the location of remains built up some sort of momentum. So there's a suggestion here that while the leg legislation provided the required legal guarantees, it took time for trust to develop between those providing the information and those working for the Commission. And that's part of what facilitated the provision of more specific information over time. Um, I should say another factor in this is that in, in 2005, the Commission began working in a different way. So their current senior investigating officer, Jeff Nutfer, um, was brought over to advise on um, essentially changing the way the search process occurred. So that's a factor as well, arguably, in the, in the increase in recovery from remains. But a number of my interviewees suggested that a key factor in terms of getting the precise information required to locate remains came as a result of relationships of trust developing between those providing the information and those who worked for the Commission. So in the Stormont House Agreement, a five-year time limit is set on the period of operation for the Independent Commission on Information Retrieval. Um, if we look at five years in relation to the work of the Commission, a lot of the, the, the success that the Commission has had in recovering remains happened outside of that five-year period. Given that the five years in terms of this time limit has already been agreed by the parties to the Stromont House Agreement, I think it's essential um, that as the ICIR is, is developed and as it's managed, consideration is given to how best to facilitate the development of trust, because it's only with trust that the provision of information will be maximised over the period of its operation. Uh, the third manifestation of trust then that I've, I've looked at is that with regards to the ICLVR, it shows that this type of mechanism can be trusted. So for one of my interviews, they talked about how the ICLVR is something practical that you can point to, to the ex-combatant or former security force constituency to say this can work. They might have misgivings around a fear of prosecution, but you can point to the ICLVR and say that this worked. So the ICLVR has been in operation now for almost 20 years, and that 
the process of confidentiality has worked, new information has leaked out, and no one has been prosecuted as a result of that process. Um, a Republican ex-combatant who I interviewed talked about how in the, in the political ex-prisoner community, they did a series of talks around what a truth recovery process would look like, and he said, the example that we used was the process of the recovery of the remains, and in the main, most guys would have been comfortable with that. So what this shows is that the ICLDR provides evidence of a mechanism that can be trusted, and in this case, um, the, the type of mechanism that some um, armed groups might be willing to uh, participate in if it was to be set up. So another lesson that I have taken from the ICLVR is the importance of leadership. So effective leadership from those involved in these processes is hugely important. Um, with regards to ICLVR, their senior investigating officer, Jeff Nupfer, was named by a number of my interviewees as being a key figure in the relative success of that, of that institution, of that organisation. So one of my interviews described Jeff as an impressive character. Someone else talked about him as a very successful appointment. Um, a Republican ex-combatant who I spoke to said that Republicans could reply, rely on Jeff Nupfer to the same extent that they were able to rely on their comrades, and he said that was crucial in terms of um, Republicans having trust to come forward and provide information that resulted in the location of burial sites. Um, with regards to leadership, it's not solely, the, leader, the issue of leadership is not purely in terms of the commission, but it's also in terms of those organisations who we would want to see um, contribute information to the commission. So on the side of Republicans, one of my interviewees talked about how um, the issue of leadership was crucial. It was, only with, it was only when the Republican leadership engaged with the issue properly and created their own structures internally to manage it. So um, in the IRA statements around their involvement in the, the process for locating the disappeared, they outlined that uh, an internal process was set up led by um, a senior member to uh, try and establish information within the burial sites, and that information was then passed, passed on to the Commission. Um, so it was essential for the Republican movement that there was, there was leadership in terms of their, their provision of information as well. So um, I think what, the, what these, these quotes indicate is that it's essential when it comes to the development of the ICIR that the correct personnel is selected for that. So in 2015, researchers from, from Queen's, from Ulster University, and also members of the Committee on the Administration of Justice came together following the publication of the Stormont House Agreement and worked with a parliamentary drafts person to draft a model bill um, of what the Stormont House Agreement might look like. And with regards to the uh, commissioner for the ICIR, they said those commissioners should have respect and confidence, be independent and perceived as such, impartial and perceived as such, have experience and skills in handling sensitive information and have no conflicts of interest. So I think the highlighting of these, um, these qualities um, show that how important it is that when the personnel for the ICIR is selected, that these issues around leadership, around independence and impartiality are taken into account. The final lesson I want to highlight is the importance of context and the spirit in which um, legacy issues are addressed. Cheryl touched on this at the, near the end of her presentation when she talked about the need for political generosity. And this is something that came through in a number of my interviews with regards to not so much the operation of the ICLVR, but in terms of the establishment of the ICLVR and the response to the campaign by the families of the disappeared. Um, so in my, in, my, in my research, I looked closely at the campaign by the families of the disappeared, and they were hugely successful as a mobilization effort. They um, lobbied local, national, and international political support and they garnered support, um, widespread support across, across uh, the political spectrum in Northern Ireland. However, another factor to their success, which a number of my interviews talked about, is the fact that at the time they were campaigning, so this would have been between 1995 and 1999 when the, when the commission was set up, um, that there was a real momentum for change and a sense of generosity, which some suggested does not exist now. So one DUP MP who I spoke to, when I said, what lessons can we learn from the process of the ICLVR and the campaign of the families? He said that the Commission on the Disappeared is a good example of how these issues can be handled sensitively, pragmatically, and in a principled way. And I hope that that can be replicated in the new institutions that we hope will be established under the Stormont House Agreement. So for the Stormont House Agreement institutions, or indeed any other institutions or efforts to address the legacy of the past, um, if they are to be effective, it requires political will, generosity, sensitivity, and pragmatism. I am going to enter one caveat, I guess, at this point, to the, um, the use of the ICLVR as an example 
um, or as a precedent, I should say, for the ICIR. So one of my interviewees, who um, he's a former diplomat who was involved in um, legacy issues in Northern Ireland for, for many, many years, and he talked about how using the IC LVR as a precedent for the ICIR makes a lot of sense. It's been done before, it has worked, and as he said, everything that's been successful in the disappeared model can therefore be successful in this truth, re truth recovery model, so the <coughs> establishment of the ICIR. However, he said, the difficulty with that is that that is a very minimal view of information recovery. This is in, by no means a criticism of the Independent Commission for the Location of Victims' Remains. The ICLVR has a very specific remit, as is in the name, it's about locating victims' remains. So if you were to look at some of the, the research around truth recovery internationally, the type of truth that the ICLVR um, has, has developed is, would be what's described as a narrow truth, so it's a very specific geographical truth, but that was that institution's purpose. Um, the ICIR, however, provides an opportunity to develop, uh, to provide families with a much broader um, level of information than the ICLVR provides. So I think this is where the similarities perhaps should end in terms of the, the type of truth that the institutions establish. So, for example, with regards to victims of alleged state crime in particular, concerns relating to national security and the related restrictions on disclosure of information by the British government, um, I think those concerns highlight the need to ensure that the legislation establishes clearly how the ICIR can function in such a way as to protect, protect those legitimate concerns around national security, but also maximise the provision of information to um, victims and survivors of the conflict. So to conclude, um, as I have set out, the ICLVR is an example of a mechanism that works in the way that is required to, by the ICIR. The lessons that can be learned from the ICLVR are, however, not limited to the mechanics of that process. The ICLVR has, has worked very, very successfully, and there are many lessons that we can take from that process with regards to how we go forward in terms of dealing with the past. As I've outlined, I think those, um, those lessons include lessons around trust, the need to manage expectations, the importance of leadership, and how that should follow through into the selection of personnel for the ICIR, or indeed other, other legacy institutions. And finally, whilst the ICLVR model can and should be instructive, um, we should not, the ICIR should not be constrained by its remit either. So the design of the ICIR should, well, it does hopefully provide an opportunity for a much more comprehensive process of information recovery, and its design should facilitate this while, of course, working within the boundaries set by the limited immunity and issues around confidentiality. And that's it.